Good morning, everyone. We're going to start soon. Thanks for taking your thanks for taking your seats, putting your conversations on pause for a moment. We're going to have an, a nice long hour-long conversation up here. My name is Colin Stanfield. I'm the executive director. Welcome to the 17th annual Nantucket Film Festival. Um, it's quite exciting, a bit nerve-wracking, and uh, a real honor to be moderating the first morning coffee in this brand new beautiful theater. I'm sure there are many people in the audience who have been uh, at morning coffees at different locations uh, over the years, and I think you'll probably agree with me, this is, this is pretty spectacular. So thanks to the Dreamland Foundation for building this wonderful theater. Um, I have a kind of casual style with these sort of things, so uh, it'll be pretty loose. I like to start first by finding out a little bit about who we're talking to so we can be a little bit, you know, sensitive to uh, the audience. So, um, show of hands, who's been to the Nantucket Film Festival before? <laughs> that is our loyal audience. Um, are there any filmmakers in the audience? Great. Um, and those who uh, come to morning coffees regularly, every year. All right. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> okay, so we've got a great uh, uh, panel of Brooklynites here to uh, talk about movies and filmmaking and their recent great successes. Um, my colleague Daniela created perfect length bios for everyone, and normally I don't like to read these, but I think it's gonna be very efficient, so I'm going to. So starting uh, stage left is Olivia Silver, who uh, happens to be a great friend and a past employee at the Nantucket Film Festival, and we couldn't be more excited that she's here as a filmmaker. She's a winner of the Crystal Bear for Best Feature Film in Berlin uh, this past year. Uh, Arcadia is a coming-of-age story set in a cross-country landscape. Twelve-year-old Greta embarks on a 3,000-mile journey in a dented station wagon. Greta's father insists that her mother will soon join them, but between stops at fast food joints, shoddy motels, and a poor substitute for the Grand Canyon, Greta realizes that not everything is as it seems. Olivia worked in book publishing before taking up directing studies at the University of California. Her first, little, her first film, Little Canyon, screened here in 2009. <laughs> Moving along, Rai Rousseau-Young. Nobody walks, follows Martine as she enters the seemingly idyllic life of an open-minded family with two kids and a relaxed Southern California vibe. Martine's arrival sparks a surge of energy that awakens suppressed impulses, to say the least, <laughs> in family members and forces them to confront their own fears and desires. Exquisitely orchestrated, the film links characters in an intricate dance of lust, denial, and deception. Rai has received several grants for her work. Her film, You Won't Miss Me, won a Gotham Award in 2009. Welcome, Rai. <laughs> Jenny Deller. I think I need to mention right off the bat that Jenny won our screenplay competition in 2009. So this is another one of our often trotted out success stories. It's great to have Jenny with us. When 13-year-old Laura Lee's single mom runs off to California, what's with all these people heading to California? <laughs> <clears throat> Laura Lee decides to manage on her own in a rural home. But her grandmother Greta, a caustic nurse, has other plans. Thrust together, the two women must learn to trust each other. Featuring an outstanding performance by newcomer, newcomer Perla Hanley Jardine, Future Weather is a compelling coming-of-age drama that explores the sorrows of saying goodbye to what we love. Jenny Deller is a writer, director, and producer. The script of her de debut feature, Future Weather, won Showtime's Tony Cox Screenplay Competition, the Nantucket Film Festival in 2009. Welcome, Jenny. <clears throat> um, Beth, and, Beth and Kara are uh, both here with the same film, The List, which... De oh, oh, I am so sorry. I knew that. I knew that. The List depicts both the harrowing aftermath of war and the actions of a single man inspired by his own moral responsibility and sense of honor to take action when his government cannot or will not 
After leading reconstructive teams in Iraq, Kirk Johnson attempts to help some Iraqi colleagues who are targeted as enemy collaborators by local militias. Johnson doesn't set out to be a hero, but his involvement grows even larger, and he evolves into a kind of modern-day Oscar Schindler. Beth Murphy is a documentary filmmaker with credits in nearly 20 films focusing on human rights and women's issues. Welcome, Beth. <laughs> Kara Elverson. Over more than 40 years, the war on drugs has resulted in 45 million arrests, making the United States the world's largest jailer. Yet drugs are cheaper, purer, and more available today than ever before. The house I live in captures heart-wrenching stories from people at all levels. The dealer, the grieving mother, the narcotics officer, the inmate, their stories combine to pose urgent questions. What caused the war, what per perpetrates it, and what can be done to stop it? Thanks, Kara, for being here. So, um, I would like to start with uh, a comment and a question to Beth. And uh, I'm going to start with Beth because Beth's film is the only one I haven't seen. So I want to be sure not to neglect it for lack of knowledge. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of an important film for the Nantucket Film Festival in that it's part of this annual collaboration we do with Facing History and Ourselves. So if any of you have been to any of these past collaborations in the, uh, over the last four years, you'll know that beyond the film usually being amazingly compelling, we have these terrific conversations afterwards uh, moderated by the executive director of Facing History and Ourselves, Mark Skversky. So that's, uh, that's really something not to miss. And Beth, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your film and, and what, uh, what, what brought you to the subject matter? How did you get started with that? I mean, it's one of the most interesting things about documentary films. When does the filmmaker and the subject matter collide? Well, thank you very much for, for having me, for having us. It's wonderful to be on an all-female panel, maybe the first that the festival has had. I resemble that comment. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I came to the list and to meet Kirk Johnson uh, because of volunteer work that I do in Boston. And I, maybe I'm the only non-Brooklynite here. I'm from Cape Cod. So uh, I live in North Falmouth, so we're very close and uh, we love coming over to Nantucket. And so I do volunteer work in Boston with um, an organization called the International Institute. And we do a lot of work with immigrants and refugees. And back in 2007, we were hearing a lot from the government about um, having a real influx of Iraqis coming over that would need to be resettled. And because this organization um, that I volunteer for does have a resettlement department, that department was really gearing up to resettle a large number of Iraqis. And there was starting to be talk at that time of this very unique population, um, people, Iraqis, who were in danger very specifically because they have an affiliation with America. So people who worked as our translators, our drivers, engineers, cultural advisors, education specialists. I mean, you almost name the industry. America needed Iraqis in order to get anything done in the country as part of the reconstruction effort. So the resettlement department was gearing up for this large influx. And then what happened? Nobody came. And it was this real you know, red flag. It was just, and I was curious to find out what was going on and what was this discrepancy between you know, what was being said at the national level and what we were seeing at the local level. And one phone call led to a next, and that's how ultimately I was introduced to Kirk, uh, who he himself had led reconstruction teams in Iraq, uh, first in Baghdad, and then in, he was the first person to go to Fallujah back when you know, Fallujah was really Fallujah, and uh, it was the height of war there. And I you know, looked at what he was doing, um, what he was setting out to do, what he never intended to do, and really saw in him the best of America. I mean, I do, I view him very much as an American hero. He is, I think, who we would like to be when we go into other countries. Uh, we, you know, I think we see ourselves as people who would, you know, we, of course we would want to know the language, we'd want to understand the culture, and you know, he did all of that. He had lived over in the Middle East. Um, knew the language, became very you know, good friends with these Iraqis he was working with, and when he returned was just appalled and, and you know, really brought to his knees um, with the knowledge that people who worked with him were in danger for that reason. And then he realized it extended far beyond his, his whole, you know, his, his personal inner circle to be you know, thousands and thousands of people who had worked for the United States. 
Well, it sounds like a fascinating story. I'm looking forward to seeing it. It screens this afternoon at 2 in uh, the Dreamland yes. downstairs. Yep, and tomorrow at 11. Yeah. Um, speaking of stories, I, I mean, we have two documentary filmmakers and three narrative filmmakers on the stage, and I think it's interesting to note that the impulse to tell a story, there's not much difference uh, in the early stages. You know, it's like the fa a fascinating guy and his heroic efforts sort of, and sort of a, uh, an imperative to, to figure out what's going on. I mean, it's the same kind of need to communicate and tell a story. And, in my opinion over the years is that the documentary form has become so much more necessary. I mean, the, the, your film, I saw this film in, at Sundance and I just, you know, was outraged at the, uh, at the well, you tell, tell us a little bit about the, 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 the kind of findings or the, the takeaways in uh, the, the house I live in, the, the story of the war on drugs. Sure. Um, thanks. So I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit and talk about um, how the film was created and conceived, which is um, the film's directed by Eugene Jarecki, and it's actually, even though it's about the war on drugs, it's a very personal story about his life um, and his upbringing. And um, the way he decided to make it was 20 years ago, um, he really uh, became very interested in the topic and decided... I have to make a documentary about the war on drugs when his, um, his housekeeper and his nanny growing up, whose first name is actually Nanny, which is a little bit confusing, um, he, uh, she took care of him from the time he was brought home from the hospital, um, and he was very close with her family growing up. Um, she's black, he is white, and um, as he grew up, he saw her family um, tied up um, more and more uh, in drugs. Uh, her, her two sons were incarcerated, one ended up dying, um, and also a daughter of hers was also incarcerated. Um, and his family just continued, to, his brothers became more and more successful, and they just kind of split. There's a fork in the road. Um, and as he talked to a number of academics and experts about you know whether this was an anomaly. They said no. Um, you know, uh, one in three African American men in our country will be locked up between the ages of 18 and 34. Will be incarcerated in their lifetime, and the primary reason for that is drugs. So it's it's not an anomaly. And I think um, what happened with him is he started to tell the story of Nanny and her fami family family. Um, and it's a very personal story for him because he kind of breaks down his own class background, the privilege he has, and the guilt he felt for keeping this woman and having her take care of him while her own family um, turned to drugs and um, was arrested. So um, we, he ended up meeting David Simon, the creator of The Wire, um, and a number of other academics who kind of helped flesh out this personal story um, and, and talked a little bit about more how it applied to the entire country. Um, so that's yeah. No, it was, it was a really moving uh, device because you know you really get the sense that Eugene, as the filmmaker, cared deeply about this family mm -hmm. and was torn up to discover that you know this really kind of um, personal and wholesome situation moved in such uh, dichotomous directions. Right. And that thread was really amplified. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the unfairness of it all, I thought, was one of my, just the, um, you know, the, the, the penalties for mm -hmm. different types of drugs seem to really be focused on uh, the, the disadvantaged. Right. And we have one character in the film um, who was caught with three ounces of methamphetamine um, and in Oklahoma, and he's serving a life sentence for that. So there are a number of, of characters who, um, you know, they're not anomalies, but we just don't, there's a lot that's, that's been going on that we don't see as Americans. It's not on television, um, and it's not talked about, so I think he wanted to bring that to light. And when he first, the first edit of the film was actually almost primarily talking heads um, and, and primarily academics who'd written on the topic, and he, he wasn't even going to put in Nanny Jetter, and he wasn't going to tell his story. And I think he realized that that's what really touches people um, is the interweaving of the personal in the documentary. Yeah, that was very effective. When is your film screening next? It's screening tonight at 8.30 and Sunday at noon, so Great. please come. Um, speaking of personal stories, uh, Olivia Silver's feature debut, Arcadia, I saw in Berlin in, a, in, a, in, a, in an auditorium that was, there must have been 2,500 people in it or something. And there were, a lot of them were young. And I was nervous because it's a very thoughtful film. 
It wasn't a peep. And they were completely mesmerized by the story. And uh, afterwards in the Q&A, uh, you know, a young, a young girl, I think she must have been eight or ten, said, where did you get the idea for this story? And Olivia blushed a little bit, and uh, I'll let her give that answer now. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the story is based on a, a personal story. When I was about 12, my, um, my dad said, you know, we're going to move to California. And I had three siblings at the time. One was in college. Um, so the, 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 th the rest of us, the, so there were three of us, uh, went with my dad. And the whole time he kind of kept telling me that our mom would, would, would join us on the other side and move with us. And, and that turned out eventually to not be the case. Um, so basically, the story is based on that, just that experience of, of being that age and not, not having any clue really what, what's actually happening with your family and kind of hoping for the best, but gradually realizing that that might not be the case. Um, but I definitely didn't want it to be just a strictly personal sort of navel gazing story. Um, I felt like, I felt like the, um, I guess the, the, the fact that it was a road trip going from East Coast to West Coast made it a sort of dramatic, you know, it was a dramatic device that I felt worked um, to have it be a story that, you know, you know, hopefully would interest other people and, and have enough drama to it that, that, it, that, it, that it would be interesting. Um, How did it feel to have labored with that screenplay for so long and mm -hmm. wrestle with the, you know, the balance between those details which represented your personal mm -hmm. story and trying to craft it into a story that had a, yeah. you know, two hour arc and then see it yeah. on, on screen. <laughs> well, it was a really long process. Um, so I, I went to film school and it, I was there five years to graduate film school. And one of the first, um, one of our very first writing classes on, our, on one of the very first days, they, the exercise was to just sit down and write the very first memory or dream you could think of. And, and one of, one of, the things that I wrote was a scene where we arrived in California, uh, you know, completely not expecting what was there. Because we had come from a really leafy, uh, I, we moved from Connecticut where we had a lot of land and, and that was where I had spent my entire life up until that point. And then to arrive in suburban Southern California, it's kind of a shock as a kid when you have a little postage stamp yard and all the houses are crammed up next to each other. And I, I, I just remember that feeling of, you know, as, as a 12 year old of, wow, I guess this is what my life's gonna be from now on. And that, that was the kernel that the story came from. Um, and that scene is in, in the film now. But um, so that started years and years ago when I wrote that scene and I turned it into a short film that was, at, uh, that was my thesis film at UCLA. And then, and then that became a feature. Um, so I think over the years, I definitely distanced it from myself and, and changed the script a lot um, because it, there needed to be, you know, different elements in the story that made it a traditional story um, with a beginning, middle, and end. And so while the, the impetus for the story is true, a lot of what happens in it, the actual details aren't, aren't true. Um, and I think that helped also to not make it feel like a strict, you know, documentary or, or personal story 100%. So. Uh, turning to another subject, that screening in Berlin was a very exciting one for me. My, my, uh, my heart was bursting with pride for you. It was very exciting to so many people, and it was one, uh, it was one of the few tweets I've made in the last uh, <laughs> six months congratulating Olivia on her great screening. But I think it, it brings up an interesting um, piece of this whole process. You know, it's a very singular effort when you're developing a story and then all of a sudden you're thrust on stage and, uh, and you know, you may have been hoping for this type of eventual, but you probably haven't planned on it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the recent festival experiences because all of you have, have, have been having a, kind of a wild ride of late. Um, the film was finished, you start applying to festivals, and then you get in, and the, the wild ride uh, involved with that. Um, ride, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your recent... When, when, when did things start? I guess at Sundance this year for um, you. Sure, yeah. Well, just so you guys know, the, the movie is also... It's about... Uh, it's a feature fiction narrative um, about a New Yorker that comes to stay in the pool house of a Los Angeles family and basically <laughs> to work on a, an art project basically that this 23 year old girl played by Olivia Thirlby, I don't know if you guys know who she is, she was the best friend in Juno, that's sort of how people know her. Um, 
So she comes to stay in the family of this house and sort of disrupts family life and the whole balance and equilibrium of everybody's lives from the father, uh, who plays by John Krasinski from The Office. He plays Jim on The Office. He's in a very different role here, sort of more dramatic. The movie's a drama with some elements of comedy, I would say, um, as well as the mother's house and even the little boy and the teenage daughter. So it's kind of a stranger comes to town type of story, but almost turned on its head, where you relate to not only the stranger, but also to the lives that the stranger is affecting. Um, that's just a little backstory on the movie. And it's called Nobody Walks, because it is about a New Yorker in Los Angeles. And <laughs> <laughs> but um, but we, we did the Sundance Screenwriters Lab, um, which was a really helpful, I, I also co-wrote the film with Lena Dunham, who I don't know if you guys have seen that show on gir girls. Um, which was a really fun collaboration. Uh, and we, we wrote the movie and then uh, went to the Sundance Screenwriters Lab, which was sort of a really valuable piece of making the whole project kind of come together. Um, after the lab, we added scenes, we took away scenes, we said, that's navel gazing in that same way. There were parts where we were like, oh, that's not right, this is right. Um, and then we shot the film actually almost exactly a year ago in June. Um, and edited it, and then it premiered at Sundance uh, 2012, last January. Um, and that was also a kind of an a intimidating experience where, you know, it's the first time you're ever showing this movie really to 1,200 people, and you have no sense whatsoever of, you know, you like it, your producers like it, the small screenings that you've shown people in Brooklyn or wherever like it. But, or you've, got, you know, you've gotten a real sense of it, but then just show it to a really large group where almost, you know, you know that there aren't some friends in the audience and, you, and there are critics and there are people tweeting and, um, and it's a very surreal experience in that sense of trying to gauge, you know, and I'm sitting in the audience in the dark and my mom is two rows back from me and we're all trying to kind of figure out, take the temperature of the room. Um, and it went really well and, uh, the movie comes out in October. Um, Magnolia is releasing it. They're a distribution company who did movies like Melancholia, the Lars von Trier movie with Kirsten Dunst. Um, and we've played other festivals sort of since then. Um, we're playing at BAM Cinema Fest um, on Saturday. And I mean, that's one of the, I think, one of the most valuable things for me about, and you guys can probably speak to this too, about having, um, about making a movie is that then interacting with audiences like you guys and in Q and A's and experiences like this, sort of all across the country or the world, whether it be in London and hearing what a British audience thinks of it and what are their kind of references for the movie. And um, each audience in each kind of city and place has, a, has almost like a different take on the movie and a different perspective. And that's what I love about it is the exchange and kind of understand, you, I learn more about the movie that I made from what audiences, from that dialogue, so that's, that's really valuable. So thank you for coming, guys. And thanks for being. Does anybody else want to add a little bit to that that uh, that uh, journey from creating, working, shooting, and then being thrust into the sort of public forum at a film festival and uh, what that feels like? Uh, well, for us, we we um, we. This is my first feature. Um, I started the project six years ago with. The, the only expectation was to make a first film, a first feature film. So to go on this, you know, six-year ride, um, and you know, have the great fortune of of winning this screenplay contest here, where where I ended up meeting Lily Taylor, who was on the jury and was perfect for one of the parts in the film, and getting to cast her, um, and then you know, bring on other incredible cast members. We we also are um, so thrilled to show Amy Madigan um, to audiences again in a way that I don't think they've really gotten to see before. She plays the grandmother of the 13-year-old the girl in the film, um, and she's just fierce, you know? She's parts for 60-year-old women like this don't really come around very often, so. Um, but you know, it was, it was a long journey, and, and, but there was a lot of goodwill towards the film, and it kind of grew as it went. So to premiere in April at Tribeca, which, um, I should also note that Tribeca Film Institute had supported the film through the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which is um, 
I'm sure many of you who listen to NPR have heard, you know, science, science reporting is often funded by them and they, they support film um, that showcases characters or characters who are scientists or technologists or uh, themes in, that, in those fields. So they had supported um, the project through the Sloan Foundation. So it, it was kind of like a coming home again. And I keep telling people, like, they're like, well, what was it like? What was the premiere at Tribeca like? And first of all, it was in New York City. So that's just kind of surreal to, you know, I'm, I mean, I'd lived there for a time and I, I was, you know, a very avid movie goer. And, um, and so then to go see your own <laughs> film on a screen in New York is kind of weird. Um, and then, but really, I, keep, I always tell people it was like, um, it was like a, a birth, a wedding, a bon voyage, and a bat mitzvah, like all at once, you know, it was like a, a send off. So, you know, I felt like this thing, which I, you know, you filmmaking, it can often be a very, um, in, you know, quiet, secluded process. You're editing forever in a room with like one other person, maybe you're occasionally showing a producer or, you know, showing a few, a, a group of friends, you know, a rough cut, um, sort of inch closer and closer and then finally get it out to audiences who the film is really for and why you are making it is such a fulfilling part of the process. It was just, it's been a joy. So we've kind of been on this ride since Tribeca of just taking the film to festivals and right, really enjoying this process that Rai's talking about of interacting with audiences and, and letting you complete the, the, the process really at each screening and it's true, audiences in every city are so different. Like we filmed, you know, New York was, had one sort of feel and then we, the next festival I went to was in Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, the film is set in Southern Illinois, which is where I grew up. And so it, it has a very, um, people don't think of Southern Illinois as the South, but it does have a very Southern vibe. It's like an hour North of Kentucky. Um, and the audience was there would laugh at things that nobody else had <laughs> laughed at so far and it was really fun and gratifying and so yeah we're just we're we're excited to be out in this environment you know social uh, not to interrupt but I, I wanted to hear about your festival experience but you know documentaries particularly social issue documentaries often come to festival with a plan in the fact in the sense that often there's a hope to affect change in some way and so you know, there's, you know, log in here, you know, make your voice heard to these people. This is how you can help. Did you, uh, either of you come to, to your respective premieres with a sort of action plan for that type of? Yeah, definitely. And I think in cases, you know, like ours where we are asking questions about how, you know, how do you affect change and having that be part of the process and part of what we want to be an outcome of the film, uh, you know, the production times can feel very, very daunting. And so, I mean, very much this connection with the audience and being able to talk about what that plan is, is so, is so critical. And at various points, at least, you know, for us during the process, there's a sense of, oh my gosh, you know, this is an emergency. Iraqis are dying because of this affiliation to America. How on earth can we take four years to make a film? I mean, it's happening now. The crisis is now. The drug crisis is now. I mean, how do we, you know, how do we make a difference right now? And so those things are very hard to grapple with um, during the during the production process. And so it's only now when it's getting out um, that I have such, you know, a real, you know, understanding and appreciation for why the process had to be what it was and why we need to follow the story as long as we did because there were there were changes. I mean, we did we're, we can't we don't have you know a scripted piece, and so we take we go with the story where it where it takes us. And this time also allowed allowed us to create really a, a pretty substantial four pronged. Uh, outreach and impact campaign effort that is very much targeted at particular uh, niche audiences that uh, you know, the general public for sure, but also you know very niche audiences that are um, appropriate for the film, addressed in the film, and can really make a difference on this issue. And so you know I'm very grateful for this you know facing history and ourselves collaboration that we have um, because they'll be a real integral part of the uh, we're doing a curriculum and study guide to accompany the film for a large um, age group, and they'll be integral in in helping with that 
that effort and helping um, you know, get into school systems um, an understanding of the moral consequences of war, the human consequences of war and where our moral responsibilities lie and what, what this you know, past now that we have with the Iraq war says about our future and how we might wanna behave in the future in other, in other places. Uh, we're also working with the military. We have um, strong ties with um, a national military organization, IAVA, the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America and we'll be doing special programming with them as well as the legal community. And then we'll be, we're planning a lot on uh, Capitol Hill to have legislative change. Great. Yeah, I also just wanted to, to talk about our premiere at Sundance, um, which was very unusual actually, because um, we, so we filmed for over four years in um, over 20 states in the country. Um, and for people who end up seeing the film, it's at all levels we filmed with dealers, um, inmates like the one I mentioned before, Kevin Ott, um, who's serving life for methamphetamine, um, his family, um, other inmates and their families, uh, and then judges, politicians, um, academics. So we really hit all levels and we finished the film the night before it screened at Sundance and quickly got it over there. Um, just because we had such a wealth of material, it took a really, really long time to chisel out what we wanted to say in you know an hour and a half um, and make sure that the that we got the right points across. Um, so one thing that we didn't that we didn't bank on was we invited a few of the characters uh, from the film to come to to Sundance to see it, and we called them about a week before because we were you know busy finishing the film. Um, one character we had that that came there was um, someone named Mike Carpenter, who's the chief of security at Oklahoma prison where Kevin Ott is serving. Um, so we had him and then we had Kevin Ott's mother who um, you know, has been trying to get him out, has a whole campaign going on to try and um, get him out of prison, um, reduce his sentence. And then we had a neurologist, Carl Hart, and then we also had the father um, of someone um, named Anthony Johnson who's uh, serving time for drugs. Um, and Anthony's uh, daughter um, was just born while he's been in prison he and Dennis don't have a very close relationship, so Dennis had never seen his daughter before. So we had them all come. Um, they hadn't seen any footage at all. Um, and they came to the premiere and met each other. Um, and it was really surreal because, um, you know, they're not fictional characters, they're real people. Um, and during the film, um, Dennis was sitting next to Betty, Kevin Ott's mother, and they're both crying. And that was the first time he saw his, his granddaughter. And, um, I think we just realized because they kind of almost become fictional to us in the edit um, and you know in the production and that they were they were real people and that they were having you know this this huge life-changing experience um, watching themselves and their true lives on the screen so um, that was that was very unexpected I think um, but we have a we're our company is doing a little something different with the film um, instead of going on to our next production, we're spending the next two years on outreach. So um, we're targeting low-hanging fruit, um, legislative low-hanging fruit across the country. Um, with the film, we're gonna try and show it um, to local politicians. One example is in California, there's an initiative that's gonna be on the ballot um, this fall, um, the Three Strikes Initiative. So uh, in California, you can serve, uh, have a life sentence for, um, uh, three strikes, um, and the third strike doesn't have to be violent. So someone who you know stole a slice of pizza off the Santa Monica Pier, for instance, will then get a life sentence. A lot of those have to do with petty drug crimes, um, and we're trying to change that third strike so it has to be violent, which doesn't sound like a, a big deal, but um, it would actually free 4,000 people from prison and save the state millions and millions of dollars. So we've been showing the film across the state, and we're trying to raise support um, for that this fall. That's great. So I guess the other plan that often goes into uh, festival premieres, not so much at our festival because it's not really an acquisitions forum, um, but festivals like Sundance and Berlin and Cannes, uh, a lot of planning goes into the sales efforts. Now, the filmmakers on stage are uh, in a kind of rarefied air as far as their films go in that they have recognizable actors in them, there are uh, filmmakers with track records. These represent 
sellable films. So I assume most of you had sales agents attached when you made your world premiere. Is that a lot of head nodding going over there? So um, a sales agent is someone who represents the film for sales at a film festival and takes a sales commission when they execute a sale to a distributor. Um, they have a lot of ex expertise and uh, have relationships with the distributors and whatnot. And particularly at Sundance, it's very orchestrated. You know, there's a lot of strategy goes into getting the best screening, getting the talent there to make the most buzz. And uh, some, at some festivals, it's kind of a, it's a buying frenzy. Did any of you experience the uh, quintessential bidding war recently? Not so many nods. <laughs> we, we actually um, had, a, had a harder time selling it than we thought because it's such a serious topic. Um, a lot of distributors didn't think that it would sell um, because it's, they, you know, they said it's too dark, who wants to know, you know, especially in these times, who wants to hear about the war on drugs? So um, that was something that wasn't expected. Yeah, we, we heard something similar about it a year ago when we originally had planned to uh, release the film, which is nobody wants to hear about Iraq, Iraq, nobody cares about, we're done with Iraq, we're done with Iraq. And I thought, wow, we have really, really bad timing, uh, which reminds me of my last film, which was focused on Afghanistan, which when that came out, it was done with Afghanistan. <laughs> and, um, but because this film was heavily funded by ITVS, which is a big funding arm of public television, uh, the, it come, the deal comes with broadcast rights for public television. You just don't know what strand. So uh, the POV, the independent lens, then you start negotiations with the strand. So for North American broadcast, I mean, that was already wrapped up for us going into the festival. So we didn't have to really think about you know, that at all. But we did go into the festivals um, with, the, with an international sales agent who's, who's working on all of our international distribution. Uh, let's see. No bidding wars. <laughs> um, Tribeca is kind of a tricky festival for sales because, you know, it's in New York, so all the distributors are there. So logically, they could come, and many do. Um, but it's sort of what is it? The fourth festival down from Sundance, our th third big sales markety. But it's so so that their their attention is a little. Less, but um, we had a fanta We have a fantastic sales agent named Rana Wallace, who has been in the business for a long time, and she's just very. She just pushes ahead, and she knows everybody, and. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're we're entertaining a couple of offers right now that we're trying to, suss out. Um, you know, which is gonna. A be the best for the film and its life, um, and B also kind of what. And we, I am referring to Kristen Fairweather, who's um, the producer of Future Weather, who's right over there in the blue dress. Um, <laughs> we're trying to also suss out what, what, how, mo how much of a commitment we want to make to the film over the next year or two. And, you know, at a certain point, I think we both are very eager after six years to move on to a new film. Um, but in this climate with what, what many distributors call a small film, um, independent producers really have to like be there and take the film, I mean, really see it through every single phase of the process and distribution is really the kind of most important one in a way because it could just die if you, if you, you know, don't really see it through. But, um, you know, the, I, I say small film and I think what I'm starting to learn about that is that, you know, we might have a couple of name actors in the film um, recognizable faces, but they're not big enough to, you know, pull in, I guess, box office numbers that will really make a, com a larger company the profit they need to sustain themselves. So their overhead, you know, we're too small for their overhead in a way. Um, I don't think it's a small movie in terms of, <laughs> like, <laughs> impact. But, um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot about, I think, managing expectations. You know, you... you you make a film with a, you know, it, you always have this fantasy that you're going to end up at Sundance and have a bidding war, but, but we've always been really practical about, like, well, you know, what if that doesn't happen? Because right. it's probably, you know, 90% chance that it's not. So, um, so we were just very prepared for sort of every process and, or phase of the process. And um, 
you know, have even entertain had had even entertained a self distribution plan, and what would that look like if we need to do that? And so, um, yeah. Anyone else want to talk about their sales adventures, or should we move back into the art realm? I'd actually like to move back into the art realm because I think there's something um, interesting, uh, perhaps across the stage, but definitely over there amongst the narrative group. I think all three of you benefited from uh, kind of intensive development periods. Um, Jenny, as the winner of our screenplay competition, spent a month here in October participating in the Screenwriters Colony. And right, you were at the Writer's Lab. And Olivia, you were at Sundance Writer's Lab with your short, or? Uh, no, the, the Arcadia was at the Sundance Producers Lab. Right. Um, and then I did uh, the Film Independent Directing Lab, which was another, it was a two month um, lab, and then some other, some other development programs. Right, so, I mean, as we talked about earlier, it can be a very uh, solitary endeavor to really struggle with your script and try and make it. And then the importance of feedback, particularly from industry experts and other writers and whatnot that. Anyone want to share a little bit about how that helped them maybe get, break through a wall or get over a hump? Oh. I think films are so hard to get made at all. <laughs> like, it's a miracle if you get a movie made. I mean, seriously, like, everyone on this panel has done an amazing job because they've all gotten a movie made, and I think that in itself is an amazing accomplishment. Um, and I think that the labs really help on multiple levels. Um, they help get the movie made in a, in a, real, in a very real way as in people see that you've done a lab and it's a certain seal um, of approval and helpfulness and they say, okay, this project is legit, this project um, is happening, this project has heat, whatever it is. It really does, um, people also talk about the project, you know, oh, I was at the, these are the lab projects, producers, financiers are looking to those labs. Um, in terms of what you know, what are like, what are they? What are the films coming out of those um, labs? And sometimes, like in Tribeca or in Sundance, it's the case where often the the festival that has the lab will also then support the movie. So you have better odds if you did the you know Tribeca or Sundance of potentially getting in. That's not always the case what, at all, but it does help your odds. I think at least the, you know they're going to watch the film, <laughs> which is which is an issue. Um, and then creatively, I think, uh, for me, one of the things that was so valuable is, is I had several different voices. So at the Sundance Screenwriters Lab, we had five different mentors. And most of them, um, we had John August, who wrote Big Fish um, and writes a lot of Tim Burton's movies. Uh, we had John Gaddis, who's done a lot of um, like kind of Hollywood punch-up rewrites. Uh, we had um, Susan Shilliday, who is now out of the industry, but was um, married to Edward Zick, Zwick and worked on My So-Called Life. And she wrote Legends of the Fall, which as a teenager was a huge movie for me. I don't know if you guys have seen that. It's <laughs> big. I had a Legends of the Fall poster in my bedroom. <laughs> Actually, in the back of my closet, if you part the clothes, there was like Legends of the Fall Brad Pitt poster. <laughs> TMI. Anyway. Um, so... Someone, having someone like a hero that wrote the movie of your childhood dreams sit down with you and talk to you about your script and really give you their take on it, their personal take, and what about this, and ask you questions about, well, what about this mom character? Where is she coming from? What is she thinking in this scene? And really allow you to explore the mind of each and every character, because each person kind of comes at the screenplay from a different perspective, right? So each person's kind of in, especially on an ensemble film like mine, each person kind of related to a different character. And so it allowed me to make sure that all of my characters were simultaneously really meatily developed and that they were all real people. And sometimes we would, um, in the rewriting after the lab, we'd go back and we'd, you know, rewrite a scene just from that character's perspective. And maybe it didn't make it in the final film, but to have that kind of eye in uh, two characters was really helpful to enrich the whole movie as a whole. Um, yeah, I think it's very Olivia, important. I know Lynette Howell was a, a mentor of yours at one point. Um, she's a very successful producer. How did, how did that help you sort of position your project and, and develop it? Yeah, I think that... Um, 
it, as Rai said, it just, it, it helps, the, basically, more and more and more everybody's trying to make films, it feels like, but from this, I mean, maybe you guys don't feel that way, but from where <laughs> we're sitting, I mean, it's, it's just becoming increasingly kind of cacophonous, the field of filmmakers, and I think part of that is access, you know, it's so much easier to make a film now, and have a film that actually looks good, because technology has improved so much. Um, so I think it's hard actually for people that are wondering whether or not to put their own money into a film. You know, when you're trying to get private private equity and actual money to, to make your film, they don't know, it's hard to, to distinguish between somebody who, you know, is just sort of a, a complete amateur and will end up turning out a mediocre product or somebody who's actually got something to say and a real voice. Um, and so I think these labs just help to filter out some of that. and. Um, so fr from that standpoint, I think it allows your project to have, just to kind of be raised up above that cacophony a little bit um, and make people have a little bit more trust that, that if they decide to give you their, their money that you'll do something good with it. Um, and then also just the contacts that you make help at every stage of the process. Um, one of our, actually one of my producers had a mentorship with a producer called Alex Madigan who who did Winner's Bone, um, that film, it was here actually. Um, and um, that, she, she decided to just sort of make Arcadia her mission in a way. She wasn't an official producer of ours, but she's so well connected, this woman, Alex Madigan. Um, and, and so she sort of got the script to people, said this is, a, this is a project to pay attention to, you know, this is gonna get made. And that really helped to generate enough uh, buzz for us to get the film made, and, and she connected us to John Hawks, who is is the he. I don't know if you've seen Winter's Bone, but he was nominated for an Oscar for his performance in that as the uncle. Um, and so again, that was another sort of step in the process. That now that we had a a, a great actor attached, that that p could make financiers and other people start to picture it as a real thing and not just an imaginative because so many even at the script level so many films never get off the ground i mean the majority i would say or at, at at some point it'll fall apart you know so many friends of mine will have had financing in place only to have it completely fall apart two weeks before shooting and the film never happens um so so that these were all things that that each little step sort of strengthened the project and made it an inevitability after a while your, your film screens today as well, doesn't it? What time? Are it screens you? at one, one, one o'clock today. Yeah. All right. Here, I think. We're going to turn to questions soon, unless anyone wants to add anything. I, say, I mean, in, in the, um, I mean, this is the, you know, raising the, the projects up. You know, we all know that it takes a lot of money to make the films, but the, most of the places in the industry to go for industry funding, they're, they often are very small amounts of money. I mean, really, you know, five, 10, 15, 20, maybe up to 50,000. But I mean, the, for, for the big, big money players, there are really so, so few. So the question is, well, you know, what good is five or $10,000 going to do? And, you know, for, in our case, um, the Tribeca Film Institute through the Gucci Tribeca Fund was one of our very early funders. Small money, ultimately, but the impact of that grant is significant because it says to the rest of the industry, pay attention to this project. And you know, then you know, beyond that, um, you know, I'll just—I'll never forget something my my mentor said. I had done a, a program on documentary filmmaking at George Washington University, and um, the woman who run, started and runs the program, Nina Gilden CV, has just been a been a phenomenal mentor over the years. And she would watch various cuts of the film, and you realize—I mean, that's a time when I get really insular, with with very few eyeballs on on the film at the very early stages. People who I know will, you know, understand and respect my vision for the project, but have really incredible um, feedback, because you know, in, in cases you know, like with our with the documentaries, there's a lot of information we want to get across. There's stuff we want you to know, and we feel like if you don't walk out of there with that knowledge, we have done something really terribly wrong. <laughs> But then there are things like, which I think, you know, documentary films are so uniquely able to communicate, the, you know, th things about injustice and fear and loyalty and betrayal and hope, things that really connect us in the most personal way. And balancing those things, balancing the information that we think is so critical to have to connect with the issue, um, Ultimately, I think we start, I at least start off with a lot of that information in there that ends up through this, this, this you know, mentorship process often um, 
becoming much more honed into the real, you know, that real human connection, because uh, that's really what ultimately is connecting us with the drama of the story and the people. And Nina said to me, uh, you know, we started the film with about 500 hours worth of footage, and as you know, we're whittling this, whittling this down. Um, the beginning stages are really hard, but as we started to get closer and closer, and the, and the cuts were feeling better and better, and I was getting really excited about things, she just said to me, she said, Beth, you know, the film is becoming what it wants to be. Mm. And I'll never forget that. It's actually hanging on my, my office wall now. It's <laughs> a good thing to remember. All right, let's turn to the audience for some uh, questions. I'll repeat the questions so we get it on, uh, on camera here. Anyone up front? Um, how much of you guys uh, edit your own work? You were mentioning a little bit about editing your own work, and I wonder um, what the process is like if you're editing it yourself or if you have an outside editor helping you. And if you have those moments that you love that somehow don't make it into the actual story, and what's that like? You could expand a bit about that. The question is, do you edit your own work, and how do you deal with your babies being cut and left on the editing room floor? Um, well, I've, I had always edited all my own shorts. I love the process of editing. I think for me that was the first technical thing that I learned in filmmaking that gave me the bug. You know, it was like, ah! I'm, I, because I, I came from an acting and writing background and, and then the editing was that final piece where I was like, I am now in the world. <laughs> um, and so, but for my feature film, I, you know, I said, as I said, this was my first feature and I, I really wanted to learn, you know, I, I still want to learn, but, but I wanted to learn from a, an editor who had edited feature films before and, and have that as part of the process. So we worked with um, Shelby Siegel, who has worked with, I think, a couple of Jarecki's, maybe. Yeah, yeah she <laughs> worked with us. She's yeah. done docs, she's done narratives, and she really responded to the story, and we just hit it off, and it was actually one of the most um, kind of fertile collaborations in the, the making of the film. I really enjoyed working with her. We had you know, very similar sense of performance and truthfulness and so really never really had to argue about like which take we preferred. Um, although I did kind of find my, you know, as the director, you, in each phase you kind of learn like where you, ha how, to, how to hold your ground and how to um, stay true to your vision and the truth that you feel is coming across. Um, so, so there were definitely those moments in the process and um, you know she had a limited amount of time she was we didn't have a lot of money to edit and and she was also um, pregnant and so at a certain point she left and I you know took on took over and um, you know it is very it's very solitary and so but early on we'd really decided we were going to use feedback screenings at sort of key moments in the process um, and it was audiences were incredible you know they Storytelling, I think, is such, it's so old. It's its own language, and people, people have it in, kind of instinctually, in a way. And so they would kind of, in a way, it was almost a lazy form of notes. It was sort of like, well, we, we're not going to take notes ourselves. We'll just put it out there, and people would give us these notes that were just really kind of uh, spot on for where we were in the process. You know, and notes are interesting. They're not always, like, articulated exactly as, you know, th what the what you should do, but you get the symptoms of a problem and, and you work on it. Um, but the killing your babies thing, I, I don't know, I'd, I'd always heard about that, and I think by the time I got to the editing process, I was kind of tough. <laughs> I'd been toughened up by raising the money and shooting the film, and, and I had decided I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna be precious about this. I'm just gonna cut what I need to cut to make the movie the best possible movie, and, um, you know, was pretty, pretty good about it until probably the fine cut. And then there was just this one little passage that just wasn't quite working and we just kind of knew we had to lose this scene that like, was very dear to me, it was very dear to Kristen, and, um, but we just knew for the good of the movie it, it had to go. Um, you know, and you still, as the filmmaker, sometimes you watch the film and you're like, oh, I missed that scene, but you know that Audiences might not have really um, taken the movie as, as well if, right, it, right. if we'd left it in. That's a great answer. I'd like to get one more question in. Sure.
go back and you have all your material, you sort of know what you have in your mind, and then do you write a script for the purpose of editing? Question is, do you as a documentary filmmaker work with a script uh, from the beginning, or do you come back? Uh, orchestration or preconceived approach to filming? So I you know, don't, work off of a, don't work off of a script. And you know, when I met Kirk, I mean, I really had, he was very much at the beginning of his journey. So I really didn't know where the journey was going to take him. Therefore, I didn't know where it was really going to take us. Um, so over more than four years of filming, uh, you know, we're accumulating everything. And then as we're putting together kind of rough, you know, rough scripts or outlines, you know, an edit outline based on the material that we have, um, it's then that you start to see, at least I do, start to see some holes in, in what we have. Um, and then usually we call them, you know, pick up sh shoots or pick up interviews, things like that, just to kind of, you know, fill in the, fill in the gaps, um, especially in cases where they're, they're also, they're unscripted, they're, you know, unnarrated. And um, so we definitely noticed holes. I mean, a big, a big hole for, for me and for us with the film um, was in fact what we had filmed in Iraq during our first shoot there. And you know it was very um, it was very clear um, just a few months after returning that we would have to go back to Iraq and film there again with people who were still on on Kirk's list and people who needed to people who needed to get out. We had traveled um, to Iraq with Kirk and one of the human rights lawyers working on these cases of the Iraqis who needed to be saved, and we really needed to spend um, our own time there as well and really really get into the homes of people. Um, follow follow people more on their journey as opposed to when we were there with Kirk following his journey there. And so that became, I mean, that was, that was a pretty massive hole for us and it delayed our um, production schedule by about a year. Actually, a story that came out in last year's Q&A, um, filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, his writing technique would involve saving some key interviews for toward the end of the, f the, the shooting process and to have gotten to that point where you know where the holes are, and then you've got some of your best interviews where you can sort of lob them questions to answer exactly the pieces that you, that you need to fill the story. Yeah, we, we um, had a similar process to you in that we just had a rough outline um, of what we knew, points we knew we wanted to hit. Um, and it changed a lot, like I mentioned earlier, you know, um, a lot of personal stories weren't there in the beginning. It was more talking heads and experts. Um, they ended up getting interwoven, and then um, th we went through so many different cuts. Um, and basically, if you if you ever come to our office, there are these giant cork boards with index cards, and they they all have little pins, and we would just move them around. And they, there were a lot of people's stories that didn't end up making it into the film. So hopefully, they'll make um, it, make it into DVD extras. But um, yeah, we uh, we didn't have a, a script, but um, Eugene would kind of go through and figure out what was missing, and then we'd do more interviews, and um, it took you know over four years to, to chisel that out. All right, I know we have to set this room up for a film soon, so I want to thank everyone for being here this morning. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> morning coffee, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday coming up, same time, same place. Thanks so much.